You're listening to the ABC Music Talk podcast, a show for anyone interested in the music industry. In this episode, as part of the current affairs category, we hear from an American live booking agent, specifically on the impact the current global pandemic has had on the business he works within. But since booking this interview, America is also hurting for a whole other reason, that of the devastating scenes from the streets where violent clashes between pro-equality citizens and the authorities are taking place following the unlawful murder of George Floyd. Just the latest victim in systemic racism that riddles not just America, but so many other so-called civilized societies. But first, a reminder of my sponsor, Rota. Rota is for artists, managers, labels, or anyone in the music industry who needs to create video content for promotion or monetization. Rota makes it fast, easy, and inexpensive to do all of that in one place. Head to www.abcmusic.co and click the Rota logo on the homepage to access a 10% off discount for the service. So today, it's a bit of a rare treat for my listeners, because uh, I get to put my interviewing skills to a proper test, as my guest this week contacted the show to share their experience in the live sector, which I'm hugely grateful for, as I tend not to find myself in it a great deal personally, and therefore my professional network is a little limited in that world. So, welcome to the show, EVP of Bicoastal Productions, Jack Foreman. Hi, thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah, no, thanks for thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. I mean, as, as I've just mentioned, you know, I typically work on the recorded music side of the business. And so just as a consequence, they're the people that I know. Um, and so this whole podcast was meant to be a sort of, you know, a full sort of spectrum of the of the industry. And it's kind of been one of those things where, you know, somebody I might know knows somebody else and therefore I kind of can get myself into other worlds. Um, and it's been it's been personally, for me, a great learning tool. Uh, so I hope that that sort of works for other people as well. Okay, so I don't know how many of the episodes you've listened to, but all of my guests have to give their, if you like, origin story or how they got into the music business. And and if you could also introduce by Coastal Productions, that'd be super helpful. Sure. Uh, so I originally come from Wisconsin, uh, Midwest state, and uh, that's really where my origin story starts when it comes to music. I went to a school called Columbia College in Chicago, and I majored in arts, entertainment, and media management, which really brought me more and more into the live sector and got me very excited about being in this industry. And uh, my first experience was uh, with a record label. I took some time and uh, moved to New York for a little bit and then came back and got a uh, internship at the Windish Agency, which is now part of Paradigm uh, in recent years. And after that, after college, I ended up getting recruited to ICM Partners here in New York, uh, where I worked as an assistant to a prominent urban hip hop and R&B agent. And it was a wonderful experience. However, uh, I just wasn't seeing as much of a future for myself in that particular format as much as I love the music. So I ended up branching out and uh, finding Bicoastal Productions, a wonderful boutique agency at the time that was run by Ron Gartner and Fran Heller, um, a married couple who's always had a big passion for music. And, you know, ever since then, it, the rest has been history. I've been with the company now a little over six years, and I haven't looked back. We've grown tremendously, really branched out into a variety of different venues and markets all around the world. I'm actually excited. I've got a great UK tour that I'm just praying is still going to be on schedule for November, oh, yeah? uh, which we can talk about later if you'd yeah, like. I'd love, yeah. to, I'd love to hear about that. Maybe I'll uh, ask for some tickets. Yeah. <laughs> we'll buy some tickets probably. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're more than welcome to the comps so long as that uh, the shows actually happen as scheduled, but if not, maybe next year. Uh, but by Coastal Productions was founded in about 2008 uh, by Ron Gartner, who's a lifelong entertainer. And, uh, you know, we've really, really grown rather quickly as a boutique yet now mid-sized agency uh, who's just never really said no to change and to progress. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of my team and of our roster as it's grown. We really have something for everybody, whether it's a festival, a small rock club or um, a sit down performing arts center, uh, just about anywhere. We really have done a lot more overseas as well, which is very exciting for us. As I mentioned, the UK, of course, but also things in Southeast Asia that's been very exciting for us. Uh, so we really, we really change every day, and that's really what keeps it exciting for me. Uh, thank you for that. So Southeast Asia as well. We, we could probably even uh, chat on that. That's a huge part of my kind of uh, 
I guess last half a decade plus experience. Um, but uh, so so wait. So the the UK the UK Act who, is it anyone that we're, we're going to know? Because I, I we have so, we sort of have a, an act in common. So I I used to distribute an artist called or a, a group called the Red Hot Chili Pipers, a Scottish record label called Rel Records when I was at Ingrooves. So I know and you represent those guys, right? I do, yeah. And actually, that's not the group I'm talking about. They're they're always on tour in the UK, and they're always on tour in Europe, all all around the world. They're unbelievable. They're just total road, road warriors. And uh, the act I'm actually talking about is Lee Rocker from the Stray Cats. Oh, wow. um, he's going to be doing a, a five city tour in the UK in November, as it's scheduled. And uh, we're going to be headed to Paris, Finland, and Russia right after that. But I, I've just been so excited about that. And uh, you know, that was kind of one of my first thoughts when this whole thing happened with the COVID-19 crisis, you know, of course, aside from all the tours that I had on the road here in the United States, including the Red Hot Chili Pipers, uh, our biggest, our biggest fear in that moment was, are we going to be able to get these guys back home to Edinburgh? I mean, it was, it was scary for a moment. We had them out on a bus in the middle of the country and uh, shows were getting canceled left and right. And safety is really first and foremost. And then getting people home to their families is, is certainly up there. So it's it's a bit of a wild time, but things change every day and we're trying to stick with the change and really be a part of it so that we can really power through this. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's I think it's been just challenging in general for for so many many reasons. Staying with that, uh, which is obviously the subject matter of this, can you start by giving giving us some sort of timeline as as you saw it as, as as sort of how it sort of unfolded, obviously with a sort of a bias towards your your business side. Sure. I, I was seeing murmurs of it and rumblings of it in Southeast Asia in January and February. Uh, I, I'm a big sports fan, and I was following a lot of sporting events that were happening out there, and they were starting to be postponed and canceled purely out of caution rather than panic. Uh, the, the promoters that were out here and in the UK that were promoting those events were saying, you know, if we can cancel it, if we can push it, fine. Uh, but then as March crept in, as some cases started coming over here, spreading throughout Europe. And as Italy became more and more um, infected, it became a bit of an inevitability that it was going to make landfall in some of these other countries. And when it happened here, it really hit us like a ton of bricks because we were seeing it happen and we thought, you know what, it'll be managed, it'll be okay. Everybody will have the right response to it. And then sure enough, shows just immediately took a dive uh, in the middle of March it was, I believe, a Wednesday or a Thursday where all the calls really came in at once. Uh, and it was that next day, I believe, or the day after that I told my staff not to come into the city or at least to come into work. Most of my staff is based in New York City. Uh, and I commute in from the Jersey Shore. And it was very, 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 very frightening, you know, for that fact alone. But also we had countless artists out on the road. We had tons and tons of shows scheduled uh, from March into the summer and even beyond that, that all became a question mark. And as an agency, we rely heavily on those shows to happen, to operate, and to also support our artists. And you fear for their safety. You feel you fear for the safety of the promoters and the venues and the staff at these venues uh, who've been just hit tremendously. However, these past few months, ever since everybody's been at home, we've been working. You know, we've been keeping busy. And for the people that are booking, you know, we're happy to be booking as far out as 2022, amazingly enough. And for some of the other people that are just trying to figure things out, we're at least on the phone with them and we're having conversations every day. You know, I'm, I'm telling my agents that if if you're not consistently booking something, that's okay. We don't expect you to be consistently booking things like crazy right now because who in their right mind is buying for the months ahead unless they have a clear plan and clear direction from their local government. But the agents uh, have been able to have conversations that are meaningful with all the promoters, all the buyers, all the theaters and the venues, and just see how everybody's doing, what the plan is. Are you starting to experiment with virtual programming, which we can delve into as a whole other yeah, topic? Yeah, well, uh, well, I think we'll, we'll we'll try and tackle some of that sort of you know more positive stuff uh, in a little bit. But yeah. um, I, I mean, this this whole kind of this whole loss of income piece. I mean, this is I, so I and I I haven't really understood how it works in uh, in in america i can only kind of look at it through the lens of of the uk i i person a part owner in a in a bar so sort of within the hospitality business in the uk and the government here have been uh, surprisingly amazing at supporting businesses like that through uh, a sort of mixture of you know furloughing staff so providing through the majority of salary directly from government um as well as grants and so 
whilst we're not able to turn a profit as a business, at least we haven't lost the business. And but I can't. That's not the same in in the states, right? It can be. You know, for the businesses that were able to receive aid, it was helpful, uh, largely to maintain your staff, uh, which is really the focus of these government grants in large, uh, although our Congress passed something yesterday, I believe, that may change some of the leniencies behind that government funding. But that's really what it was, is trying to keep people employed. However, for the gig economy workers, which is just a serial part of our industry, where you've got stagehands and you've got venue crews and you've got concessions crews, touring managers and everything in between, they really didn't have as much help. You know, they're all independent contractors at large. And you know, they really had to figure this out in a lot different way. And for the artists, the artists are all grounded. Um, a lot of shows were canceled and um, big goal for us was to try to reschedule everything to make sure that these things did emerge on the other side, even though it's not necessarily new revenue, it's deferred revenue because it comes in place of making future revenue at a time when you were expecting it. You're really just making up for what you missed. And that's okay because that's at least something and you're staying busy and you're staying active and it's a blessing. It really is. So, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest part of it. But, you know, as an agency, we have, we have our commission and everybody knows that that's really how we make money is we make money from whenever our artists make money. We're not getting paid a retainer or a, a certain rate. No agency really gets that unless it's a special circumstance. We make money off of what we book. Um, so we've had to be crafty, uh, but we haven't, we haven't let that bring us down. You know, we've tried to be as kind as we can to everybody in the industry that we work with, trying to be supportive in, in the ways that we can be, uh, that any agent can be, because plenty of our, our presenters and our, our performing arts centers, especially, they're canceling their entire 2020, 21 seasons. So that means they're not even looking to do shows until maybe as close as fall of 2021. That's unbelievable. You know, to think that next June, even they won't have shows to close out their season. So that's really, that's really been the impact for us. But at the same time, if we just sit and wallow in it all day, it really does nobody any good. So we've been trying to really be positive and motivate our artists to stay busy, promote content, uh, create content. So that's really what it's been for us. Yeah. I'm, I and and, I th and we will get to to some of the things that have been going on at the moment. I, can you just uh, just for the benefit of some of my listeners, uh, the the aim of this podcast is a little bit sort of you know education through storytelling. Um, so I'm, I was originally aimed at sort of younger people coming into the industry. Although what I've discovered, as uh, I've, I've mentioned before on the podcast, is actually a lot of my peers listen to it because they're listening to episodes about subject matters they don't really know a lot about, um, which is which is great. I love that uh, the fact the fact that people want to learn, uh, even if they are uh, you know lifelong members of the industry. But so that that whole sort of that that income piece. So you've got the venues that are providing refunds through to essentially the fans of the artist that you look after. So or not. <laughs> right. OK. So just can you just sort of help just unpick that a little bit? So the refunds are either given or not given. But like, how does how does that all work? Because I know that some people have been very good at sort of giving that option around. Well, don't take the refund. But put it towards the, the show that when we can actually do the show, you'll have the ticket already. I mean, can you just sort of help us understand a little bit what's been going on there? Of course. What, what it really comes down to is the promoter and what they're able and willing to do for the future when it comes to those paid tickets, especially. If you had a ticket to a show in March that was canceled um, indefinitely or canceled outright, the promoters are in a lot different position to where they really do owe you their money back or your money back, and just regardless of what the policy was when you agreed to the terms and conditions when you purchased the ticket. Um, however, if there was a postponed show, they really are going to do everything they can to try to hold on to that ticket revenue and say to them, look, you know, hang on to your ticket. It will, of course, be honored. Or if you want to redeem it for a full refund in the form of a credit or a gift card to our service, and then some with a bonus amount on it. So you may end up receiving 125% of your ticket value back from a Live Nation Ticketmaster or AEG event. There's a there's a promoter in the United States called Logjam Presents that promotes in the um, in the Northwest United States. And they there was just an article this morning on Polestar about it where they you know they're they're offering I believe it's either a 125% or 150% um, refund or credit if you will. And they're not offering refunds. 
at all, full refunds. Uh, so you know, that's that's there's a case to be made for that on either side. Um, you don't really know how you feel about it until it happens to you, until you have a ticket. And what we've been lucky enough to do is reschedule, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent of our shows that were canceled or misplaced. However, oh, wow. Yeah, thank God. I mean, and you know, hopefully they they stay rescheduled. Um, yeah, well, and and how far out have you been, sort of realistically pushing those dates? I mean, what, what does that what does that look like? In the beginning, we were. Did you just kind of take a hard? Yeah, line? well, we we were going to. Yeah, we were going to take a hard line, and then we didn't know really what it was going to be. The hard line kept getting pushed back, so um, we were we were really rescheduling things a lot in the fall of this year, and then now. If you look at the fall, you still don't see a lot of these people able to present shows like they were thinking. And um, right now, we've actually rescheduled quite a bit until the fall of 2021 and even the spring of 2022, which is unfathomable to a lot of people who um, are thinking about the shows they were planning on going to this summer and the festivals especially. And it's country by country. It really is. I mean, I, I talked to a promoter in Finland a few weeks ago that they're feeling pretty good about shows in the fall of this year. But then a promoter in, in Russia is very, they have a much different opinion, you know, based on how it's being affected there. Other than trying to reschedule the shows, is there, I mean, is there anything else that, that an agent can kind of do in terms of helping with this sort of loss of income, uh, you know, that's going on? I guess this sort of perhaps leads into some of the ideas that, that either the artists themselves have been coming up with or with the labels that they, they're working with. And, ha, you know, have you as an agent been able to kind of get involved with any of these kind of new initiatives at all? Yeah, a agents, managers, and labels uh, have all really been pushing the artists to try to find new streams of revenue while they're sitting at home, uh, or at least plan for ways that they can make it a lot quicker once they all return to action, if you will. And one of the biggest things that we're encouraging artists to do is ticketed live streams. That's something that you never really see an agent necessarily get involved with when the artist is doing it at home, but sometimes they lack that support. And we've actually started aligning ourselves to various streaming platforms to perform and create and promote those ticketed live stream performances it's unbelievable so that you know that's something new because a few a few a few of the tech companies have been kind of adding that 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 payment mechanism into it right because i mean the donation piece was kind of everywhere at the very beginning of it which is which is fantastic yeah um, but of course you know it's that's a different kind of mechanic right asking somebody to make a, a donation to a charity versus to access this you know please help support us and, and pay for a, a, you know, a virtual ticket but yeah it was kind of good to see at least some of the mechanisms to allow that to be made viable uh, by some of the tech companies starting to come into play um or, or have you been doing it sort of outside with other eventbrite type of uh, or dice or whatever it depends. I mean, we're we're doing a project right now with a great company in the UK uh, for one of my my artists whom has created this interesting experimental project. His um, he's, his name is Gordy Marshall. He was the drummer for the Moody Blues for 25 years, and he lives in London. And he's working with a company right in London that's actually going to be producing a wonderful concert film that they're going to tape in October at the Harlequin Theatre, and they're going to distribute it as a pay per view event to venues all over. But then, you know, that's that's one way of doing it, where we may end up actually distributing it to some people um, in a bit of a different way. Um, but I, I really I really have a, a, a bunch of different answers for that, especially with another platform that we've partnered with kind of on a friendly basis. It's this platform called the Veeps, um, where they've created a platform for artists to present ticketed live stream shows with high quality where they don't take a commission. They only take a ticket fee from the ticket buyer. And it's great for the artist because the artist gets to keep more of the ticket revenue and they can do it from anywhere at any professional level. And it was started by these two brothers from the band Good Charlotte, Benji and Joel Madden. And they wanted to create something that was for artists by artists. And we've been lucky enough to get in touch with them and work with them on trying to get some of our artists involved and also get some of the venues we work with involved because they need the help just as much. That sounds really interesting, and and so and you, you mentioned the, the the term high quality. I, I have a I was curious as to in the old days of physical, you'd often find certain sort of iconic live shows being professionally recorded and and being then made available for purchase on DVD. You know, it was a whole sort of section within record shops. I mean, is that something you think that is likely to be a sort of secondary sort of chance at uh, trying to you know generate revenue? 
Yeah, I, I think that even before the crisis broke out, there was a tremendous amount of investment into streaming platforms for just about everything. And now it's just become much more at the forefront because of the fact that people are at home and that people can't go out to access great entertainment. They're finding it in other ways. They're finding it on Twitch. They're finding it um, for sports platforms. They're finding it on things like DAZN and ESPN Plus here in the States and um, all these different all these different great apps. And it really, it really was emerging before this all happened. And then now it's just gotten a lot, a lot more following. And uh, I think it's going to continue, believe it or not. Even when venues open, that doesn't mean that everybody's going to feel safe buying a ticket and sitting or standing at a big venue with a lot of people. You know, there's going, my prediction that I'm talking with a lot of my venues about is that you'll be able to open up maybe a half or a third of your house but that other half or other two thirds is going to need to be ticketed as a live stream ticket where you're sitting at home and watching it. You're watching the same show that the audience is watching on stage, but you're watching it as if it were a concert TV special. And that's, that's really my personal prediction as to how some of it's going to go. And then some shows may be completely live stream tickets. And, you know, people are finding new ways of consuming content every single day, especially the young people, you know, the people that are much younger than you and I, they're, they're serial consumers, if you will, and it's it's unbelievable. It really is. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's really really impressive. I mean, that you know, some of the stuff that that you'll know if you've spent any time in in Asia is that the sort of the tipping culture uh, out there is 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 very uh, commonplace. Uh, the, that sort of general sort of support. Um, and and have you seen that kind of be a part of that revenue matrix for for these live events? Does that work? Is that something that is a viable option? Yeah. I mean, for, for independent things, of course, tipping is huge, especially on things like Twitch and on these virtual concert platforms where people can, you know, maybe the ticket price is set at $15 or 15 pounds, whatever it may be set at, but they may have premium options where you can buy a premium ticket for 50 pounds, where you may get a little bit of something extra, or you may just be knowing that you're supporting the artist a little bit more if you have the means to. And you're seeing that a lot more. I mean, for sports that are streaming, especially now where there's not really going to be an audience for it, um, there's going to be a lot of sponsorship dollars in that because it has a wider audience in a lot of places. You know, there's always been crazy sponsorship with sports. But with concerts, you may see some of that too. You know, some of the local businesses, if it's a local venue putting it out, may decide to add some sponsorship dollars, which benefit the venue and the artist. But tipping is certainly, certainly big. And for a platform like the one I mentioned before, Veeps, you know, the, with 100% of the revenue going to the artist, if if an artist sells a thousand tickets at five pounds a piece, you know that that that's a game changer for a lot of independent artists who are really trying to put food on the table right now. And I wanted to ask you about another thing that I'd seen kind of floating around on my on my Twitter feed: people talking about uh, creating sort of small virtual venue sizes, so basically limited tickets of, that are, that are available. Is that something you support? Do you think that's a good idea? Or is that sort of a bit of a sort of trying to fit the old world into the new world, given that it's the internet and therefore anyone in the world could theoretically access it? I mean, have you got any kind of experience with that or, or thoughts on it? Yeah, I think people will always love feeling like they're part of something exclusive. Uh, it's human nature, I think. And uh, for the people that really eat that up, they're going to see that as a premium and they're going to pay good money for that, especially if they have it. Uh, you know, what's interesting, I was reading something this morning or yesterday, I believe, that... Um, one Night Records in London is setting up this whole interactive London Bridge experience where people can come into this maze of stages, if you will, where they can experience live shows, but it's going to be very limited and it's probably going to cost something steep, if um, if I read it correctly. And people are going to love it. The people that feel safe to go where they want to get out and see people and see live entertainment, they're going to love it. But um, some people won't have the means to do it, unfortunately. You know, if unemployment is nearly as bad as it is in the UK as it is here, you'll certainly um, you'll certainly agree that a lot of people won't have that kind of premium money to spend. So, I really think that it's going to it's going to depend. But I, I definitely see a rise in that. As much as I saw it before the crisis, people love VIP. They love limited secret shows, studio sessions where it may be broadcast, but still a limited few can come in and experience it live so I, I definitely definitely see a rise in it can we talk about digital marketing for a second 
it, so I mean, my experience of it is one I, I kind of work alongside some of the the best brains in the business on it uh, with with some of the work that I do with a company called Empire. Uh, but uh, I try and do it for my uh, my podcast, and I think fail continuously at it. <laughs> so I, I find it really really hard. I mean, you know, it's, I found it's, the podcast, well, so it worked on me. <laughs> I so that that's true. So that that's excellent. Like it's I guess it's some you know sort of a modicum of success then. But it, you know, I know that like organic reach is so incredibly low and to do the 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 paid advertising is you know it's it's one of those things where you kind of have to be fairly current with what's working you have to have a proper strategy you know you have to kind of really play at it you can't just sort of spend a little bit of money and hope that it's going to turn it all around do you, have you seen kind of anything that's working really well with some of the artists that, that you're working with that, that seems to engage the you know the right type of audience and and grow the audience well, pre pre COVID, I should say, uh, it really it really was a little bit different. Uh, you know, we were seeing a lot of artists engage their audience base in um, you know with, with social media type outreach, but also a lot of it from my standpoint. You know, from what I what I can semi professionally speak about about digital and tour marketing is around selling tickets. You know, they these artists are really trying to find new ways of helping the venues and helping the promoters engage the audience so that they can really do their part in helping move the needle. Um, when, it, when it comes to artists who are signed to a much larger label production or management company, there's a team behind it that kind of caters that a little bit more by hand to the artist. If it's a, a younger artist or an artist that appeals largely to millennials, they may try to market it on some of these new platforms like TikTok, you know, a billion dollar company that People spend hours upon hours a day on now that they have the time, especially, and it's addicting. So if people market that way, or if they try to slot it in when you're when you're experiencing music on Spotify or on a different platform, that's a great way to reach the people of that certain area. But it's hard to kind of call across the board, if you will, with the different types of things, especially for me with an, a roster that appeals to a slightly older audience than even myself. You know, we we approach it a little bit differently. Um, but right now in the time of COVID, if you're able to, if you're able to put out quality marketing, quality programming or quality content period, you're at a huge advantage of having a captive audience who's at home, who wants to experience that. So it's a tough question for me to answer, but hopefully that kind of gives you my, my take on it a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I realise that you're not a digital marketing expert. It was just, uh, just you know, but you're, you know, you're in the business and therefore you're seeing stuff kind of happen. So, but I, I appreciate the insight there. Um, so you mentioned sports earlier and, and I'd listened to a few of uh, your other interviews that, that you've done on some other podcasts. And uh, and I feel, I feel like, I mean, you said earlier before we started recording that, you know, you're a, you're a boxing fan and therefore you're a, you're a sports fan probably in general. Uh, other industries, I mean, sp- or we can just talk about some examples you've seen with sports and how they've, been able to cope with this uh, where they've had similar impacts i suppose have you seen anything that we can learn from there sure well with starting with sports uh a great example uh keeping with keeping with british boxing which we were talking about earlier with matchroom sports and entertainment you know becoming the global giant that it has but still having this strong base in the uk they've found ways of creating programming while the boxing rings and the arenas are dark they found ways of doing all kinds of cool throwback podcasts, throwback uh, interviews with classic boxers, and they broadcast them live on the different platforms they use. Like, for instance, Matchroom is aligned with DAZN, this great um, sports platform that's gone even more global. And uh, they also, I think in, in the UK, it's with Sky. But that's really all they can do right now until they're able to actually stage semi-live or completely live events is they engage people through shoulder programming that you may have seen, you know, as a weekday morning type of show as you flip on the TV. But now that's what their prime time is, is they have these interviews around the world just talking about when it's going to be back. But at least it gives some it gives people something to listen to, something to talk about. And in other industries, you see a little bit of it, too. Although when it comes to spectacle and entertainment types of things, you're really going to see it in that regard. You're going to see ways that people can experience it at home or from a distance. Um, For instance, my wife and I are taking our one-year-old daughter on Sunday to a drive-through safari where you, you, in your car, you're, you're driving, you're driving through this um, manufactured jungle in New Jersey 
where elephants and giraffes can come up to your car and I don't think you can feed them, but if you think about it, it's a way of being entertained in a time where you can't really get out and see people. So we have oh, a feeling our daughter's, our daughter's going to love it, but when that became available, we, we jumped on it like it was a ticket presale to a massive show. You know, we were waiting by the computer to buy tickets to it. Um, you know, and that doesn't, really, that doesn't really factor into streaming and that kind of engagement, but that really tells you how creative certain people are trying to get. They're trying okay. to find just these ridiculous ways of reaching well, people. Well, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, I have seen, I, don't, I forget exactly which country it was, but I did see a, a rather amusing um, rave uh, in a car park <laughs> where people were sitting in their cars in a very orderly fashion, I might add, you know, and sort of looked, they looked like they were like, queuing for a ferry or something like that. But, in, you know, and uh, but they were having fun. You know, there was a sort yeah. of DJ box and I, I have a feeling actually they were... Um, they were pumping it through the FM signal. So it was actually going mm -hmm. into the cars of, you know, the, where the people were, which I, I just thought, what a wonderful sort of like concept. Um, but uh, I'm not sure what they're doing it here. If you, if you, if you wanted to leave, uh, cause they don't know how you get the cars out. Like if you were right in the middle, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Or if you have to use the, if you have to use <laughs> the, the restroom or if you want to, if you want to buy a beer, you know, they're not going to yeah, have that well, as easily. Yeah, precisely. You know? yeah. It's, it's certainly not the same, but I, I appreciate people sort of giving it a go really. Um, so I just want to return real quick uh, just to sort of close out um, with, uh, you know, the civil unrest that's going on at the moment in America, um, you know, without trying to be sort of too disrespectful to anything. One of the factors that, you know, if this continues, for example, say, say COVID-19 disappears tomorrow, we've still got civil unrest on the streets. One of the big things that could impact the live industry is the things like the curfews. I mean, have you guys had to give that any thought yet or are you kind of in in such a uh, state anyway due to the pandemic that you're kind of just what i don't know hoping that that all goes away i, I don't know like what do you think it's not going to go away i think until there's significant change um this has been happening for hundreds of years and right now there's just a particular light shined on it and um you know people are people are angry people are upset as they should be something horrible happened that really reopened people's eyes up to all the horrible things that happen on a daily basis that may get kicked a little bit to the curb. And right now with COVID-19, this was a huge wake up to, you know, there was a there was a world before this all happened where there was a lot of things wrong before we were all united by this virus. If you, I mean, I hate to say it like that, but in our in our industry, yeah. Yeah, in our industry, it's, it's really, it, it, we had Blackout Tuesday this week and all all factors of the music industry participated in it. We, you know, we didn't send out emails. We didn't send out blasts. We were very respectful. And our artists were really wonderful with taking to their own social media to try to be supportive of the different efforts. And, you know, we personally, you know, we try to be, we try to be fair. We try to be, we try to be respectful just about anything we can do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not of the greatest authority to speak about this, but I can definitely say that as an American and as a member of this industry, you know, good for good for people for speaking out as long as everybody can stay peaceful and can stay safe. Um, I'd love to see change be made. I, I really would. And, and not just here, but in other countries, too. You know, it's 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 unfathomable, you know, what what went down week before last and what's been happening for so much time. But um, all we can really do is pray, you know, make our voices heard and try to be respectful and peaceful and that's really as much as I can say, but our, our industry has certainly been <laughs> certainly been rallying, trying to be as supportive and as as in line with it as we can. Yeah, I, I guess I guess the live industry is, is is one of those industry parts of the business where it can really bring people together. I mean, literally. Uh, so, uh, you know, let, let's hope that uh, hope that that happens. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's, it's always difficult to talk about these things. Um, so I think that's it. So thank you very much. Was there anything else you wanted to add, actually? Was anything you want to talk about? Uh, not especially, unless there's anything else. I uh, you know I appreciate you having me on. It's always great to speak to people who are who are excited about the future, who are um, embracing of the past. And uh, I I don't know you that well, but I can tell you're uh, kind of a music geek like me. And I yeah. do hope we see you <laughs> if these shows do happen. I really yeah, I'm love, coming. I'm coming. I'd, yeah. I'd love to see you. We're we're going to be in. Uh, we're starting it in uh, in Glasgow. I think coming down to Manchester, Newcastle, and. Bristol and finishing off in London. So we'd love to have you at the show. It's Lee Rocker, the Stray Cats and, um, you know, the Red Hot Chili Pipers just say the word. We'd love to have you at one of those shows. Too. Oh so yeah, much fun. absolutely. Such oh, they a great really show. Are. They, they really yeah. are. Uh, yeah. Oh, very good. Thank you for that. Um, okay. So, um, thank you for coming on the show, Jack. Appreciate that. Thank um, you. 
So to my listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, as ever, I welcome all feedback, comments, and suggestions for future shows. My Twitter and Instagram handle is at Alex Branson. Uh, send me a message there or head to the website, which is www.abcmusic.co, where you'll find a contacts page to send me an email from. Thank you for listening.